Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with the creator and host of Neon Jazz, yours truly, Joe Domino. This was an interview conducted by a great friend and columnist, Mr. John Bedoin, for the Link to Lee Summit, coming out of the new home of Neon Jazz in Lee Summit, Missouri. Mr. John Bedoin is the owner of KC Media Matters and has spent his life dedicated to quality journalism and all those pursuits thereof. He is a chief reason that I even got into journalism and eventually into radio. This interview is an outgrowth of our full conversation for an article that he penned and released to the world on October 22nd, 2020. Enjoy. So to tell me, how many shows of you and what are you and John Christopher up to? Well. John Christopher and I have taken a break because there's a susceptibility, obviously, with being in a pandemic, and there's a particular okay. susceptibility on his end. So we literally haven't been together since March to really do a show. Now, he's come by because I've moved to Lee Summit recently in January, and he's seen the house and hung out. We've done, like, Facebook Live, but no show. So I, I've kept chugging away. I, I am working on my 671st show this week. And who's the guest this week? Uh, this week, I kick the show off. And, and the way I do my show, which is which something that I think is kind of unique to oh, what yeah. I'm doing, is I, I feature a, uh, a, a host of these artists that I've interviewed over time. And a lot of these cats I interviewed over the, the pandemic when it really started happening in, like, March, April, May, June. This episode, funny enough, is going to feature Maria Schneider, who is probably – she has won four Grammys, been nominated for eight, one of the very unique people that have received a Grammy in both the classical and jazz world. She is a composer, and she has a new double CD called Data Lords, and it explores the, the kind of the chasm we live in right now between the natural world and the digital world. And she is genius. I mean, she is like one of the top names in all of jazz. So anyway, she'll be one of my featured artists on this uh on this hour, and then um, from there, there's there's a host of of new and young upcoming cats that I have on the show. But you said earlier, a lot of the a lot of cats you interviewed uh, earlier this year. Uh, you said you interviewed a, a lot during the pandemic in March and April. There was a lot that I yeah I over like a three month period I did I hundreds. I mean I was really really active. I didn't know what I was going to do when the pandemic hit. It was such a yeah. shocker. I just, you know, I couldn't listen to music for a couple of days. And it wasn't just because of what I was doing with the broadcast. It was the world I knew was coming to a halt. So anyway, I just started kind of reaching out. And as I started gaining steam and talking to these musicians, there was a, a incredible amounts of um, rawness coming out of them. I mean, jazz musicians, to me, as far as all the professions I've been in and I've heard and seen, they are some of the most humble, grounded, talented people I've ever been around. They're always a joy. And like I said, they're always raw. So you get them in the middle of a pandemic and going through this, there's going to be a level of raw that's going to be off the charts, especially with none of them being able to perform live music. I mean, I knew when this started, if I want to interview certain people, this is the time. The only time a lot of these people that are really high up on the food chain of the jazz world, they're only going to be able to do it now because they're not running around like crazy. And most of them, that's all they did. I mean, there were some musicians I talked to that were like, I love this. I'm finally, I don't have to like run around. I'm not touring all the time. My label isn't telling me to produce things. I'm not in constant demand. I, I'm fatigued and I can only get a rest, you know. What, so what, so was, was Maria one of those interviews earlier this year then? She actually was more mid to late summer. I have okay. some PR agents that send me material on both of the coasts. And, but she was definitely an outgrowth of that. I mean, she, she would not have been attainable if we weren't in pandemic, 100% at all. And the funny thing is, is that with people like her, she is definitely in the whole hierarchy of jazz. She's like, to me, top five, easy, of like all of them, from like Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, Maria Schneider. She's right up there. And the, she was wonderful. She was just like someone you would run into in a coffee shop. There was no pretense. There was, right. That's the great thing about it. They were just so good as humans about breaking down like one of my answers from her was you know how do you how do you construct your vision how do you do it and she said i literally go with my stomach i go with how my stomach feels in the studio if it doesn't feel right i will have a physical aversion to it if it feels right i know it's right and that right there doesn't get any more raw than that and that's somebody that wins grammy awards and does this at the highest level of any right. musician on the planet 
So you're still doing your shows, but just not with John. I thought I saw you and John together in the last few weeks. Am I wrong? But maybe I didn't. You know, we were. He swung by the house. He okay. actually he actually works in Lee Summit, so we had a minute. He swung by. But we're only doing, you know, kind of the Facebook thing where we, like, catch up and talk. Right. But as far as, like, he has a studio in his basement of all of the old broadcast equipment he's accumulated over the years, which is high end. And we haven't been able to do that. I mean, I don't even know... Man, like, yeah, it's been it's been mid to late March the last time that we did it. It's it's crazy. <laughs> you mentioned Herbie Hancock. Did 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 you know? Because I didn't. Did, I mean, did you have any sense that when 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 Herbie Hancock started to go a little well, I won't say he went mainstream, but when when Rocket hit and that video blew up on MTV, I think there's a whole new generation of people. I know I was in that list of people that, that learned who he was at that point. That man was doing incredible things in music before that, but but uh, I, I, I see him featured a lot. You know, there's a lot of, of MTV revival right now. In fact, there's a, a fantastic, if you had a chance to see it, there's a documentary on A&E uh, right now about the, the early days of MTV. Have you seen this? You know, no, I haven't seen specifically that, but what was okay. happening then was incredible. It, it, it just it just came out, I'd say, in the last three or four weeks. And I, I actually spent the two hours and just watched well, all the way through the other day because it, 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 I hadn't seen it yet pop up. And, and I thought, well, this is interesting. And it, it just kind of talks about how, in, you know, the early days of the VJs and how MTV got started. And, and But but Herbie Hancock's video is a, a part of that, of that documentary and about how 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 musicians uh, were were being introduced to a, a whole new set of of fans and of of of, of music lovers uh, who were who were turning to MTV and and they were intaking new music through videos but but that 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 the video itself started to be such a and you remember what he did in that video it was it was unheard of at the time yeah uh, with, with with that am I remembering the name right it was Rocket I think was the name yep. of that video yeah. And, and yeah, and it, yeah, yeah, and he's he's doing things that we didn't we didn't know were going to be done on MTV, and 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 a, a whole new a whole new generation of people are going, oh, that that's who that is. Okay, well, and that that's the great thing about the crossover era, and that era right there. There's an era in jazz called CTI. The label like had a lot of that kind of cross genre stuff. Quincy Jones was even. Well, I mean, Quincy's just such mm-hmm. a story cat that his his jazz career was amazing. So at that time, he was kind of coming in a little bit. There was, there was a lot of other people, uh, Hubert Laws, and, and all these other people were doing kind of this rock jazz thing. And that actually, Rocket, is one that was on the Beverly Hills soundtrack. So Beverly, Beverly Hills Cop soundtrack. So he got a lot of extra out of that. And there was a lot of those cats that were branching out. I mean, speaking of Lee Summit, Pat Metheny was doing kind of a lot of electric right. rock. We just touched on Peter Erskine, who has a Pete Carroll um, uh, uh, frame of reference with Lee Summit, and those guys were kind of doing this rock thing. And you know what? There's a level of that happening right now with young guys like, um, uh, you know, Logan Richardson's from Kansas City. He's in New York now. He's doing a lot of electronic stuff. There's a lot of these cats that are doing kind of these cross genre things because it's it's an artistic vision, but it's also marketing too. I mean, they know that they're going to get a wider audience. Um, and, and Herbie at that point, I don't know that he was really going for that because he didn't really need it. I mean, if you were in Miles Davis's band back in the day right. and you'd done what he did, yeah. you, you're not really looking for extra extra no. money or extra clicks. No. But no. you're right. That, I mean, being a part of that MTV generation, no one will forget that video from our generation ever. No, you know? no, that, 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 that was the introduction of, of a lot of, of him, I think, to a lot of you know people that, had, that, that hadn't been able to or just – didn't didn't appreciate his work not not because they they didn't appreciate it, just because it wasn't part of their uh, the, you know at that time we were all coming out of record players and into CDs and and you know if you if you weren't fortunate enough to have a, a parent or two that listened to that kind of music you just didn't you weren't introduced to it yeah no it was yeah. gonna go off your radar yeah so what uh, sure. so let, tell me remind me when was your first show for Neon Jazz. It, it was April 26, 2011, and yeah. it was in, uh, yeah, John Christopher's basement. Yeah. And John, you said, works in Lee Summit, right? He works in Lee Summit now, but at the time, and for a lot of years, he was uh, a chief engineer at Intercom Radio. Okay, that's right. 
And I've, I, I know, I know, I've heard this story over over sushi, but but tell me again, what what is it that 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 that, that obviously there was a lot that that built up before April 26, 2011. Uh, how did you and John come together, and how did you decide on on the, the, that this was the show you wanted to do each week? Well, I'm going to throw this back to you. You know, the the author of this, and just say you you were instrumental in giving me the journalism bug from a professional standpoint, from a friendship standpoint. There was so much so much of that that would have never even transpired in an hour if it wasn't for you. I'm going to say that first and foremost. Well, that's very kind. I, I, I you know, I, I don't know how much I had to do with that, but, but we, we had some, we had some, uh, we did some darn good journalism in the day, you and I. Yeah. I mean, we were award winning and we had a great friendship and I saw how it worked and I was under your tutelage. And I mean, you were the first editor in chief that, that, that at the U news that really showed me a lot of things. You took me and you knew where I was at. There was a lot of development that was going on there, but I, there was, there was very instrumental seeds, and this would not be where it's at today if it wasn't for the time that we spent, spent together or between our friendship and our professional lives. But I remember I, – the thing about journalism is it's kind of like getting a tattoo. I don't have tattoos, but when people say they get one, they keep getting them. And with right. journalism, when you get that and you have that bug, you never get rid of it. So I had gotten into IT in the Grandview School District, and – I had written at the Jackson County Advocate, and I would do articles here and there. And there was Ebenezer the Donkey who was big, and there were oh, little yeah. special interest stories. Yep. So one day, I'm in my backyard, and I'd had a summer of construction um, in my backyard, and I wanted to relax. And I went to a thrift store and found a raccoon, an old Radio Shack raccoon with the radio in its belly. And I go home, and I turn it on, and I hear Kansas City, that old Kansas City tune by Wilbur. And I'm like, what is this? And there's all these oldies on there. You know, like the old WHB days, we remember. I'm like, what is you, this? Wait, and you bought John this? Pr- I got it at a thrift store. It was just an old, like, thrift store raccoon. And it was what they used to sell in Radio Shack. And it had a radio in LA. But it was a, you said it was a, what, a raccoon, what'd you say? Yeah, it was a stuffed animal raccoon. <laughs> okay. It was like a dual purpose thing. And it had a radio in its belly and speakers that came out the side. Yeah. Um, so I hung it on the porch just kind of as a, a little relic for the kids and just in general. And there we go. There's the radio. I mean, all you could get was AM. And I put on, I think, 1140. It was KCXL. And there's John Christopher. So I filmed the raccoon, sent it to him and said, I, want, I just found a great new radio show in Kansas City. Email John Christopher. He gets back. And at the point, I'm writing for the Jackson County Advocate just doing some stories here and there. So I do a full story on him. We interview and I get his whole story, write the article that's in there. And John Christopher, after the article came out, said, hey, why don't you, uh, let's meet up for coffee and talk. Because he knew my, my broadcast background. I talked to, him, talked to him about how I was, you know, an intern and I wanted to get into radio and TV and it just wasn't something that worked out. So we meet up and we have a good talk. And he said, listen, why don't you come by my house? And at that point, I had no idea until I met up with him that he lived four blocks away from my house. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like uh, like weird, odd seller kind of uh, combination there. So I yeah. said, great. You know, he said, get a script. Come on by. And I picked jazz. I've always really loved jazz. And I was like, let me do it. Um, I, I used to listen to Kansas City radio and, and jazz was on with Mike Pentengale, Jazz in the Night on KCUR. So I come over, we do it. And, and he, was I working, am, he was working KCXL at the time, right? Well, he does some work for them at his shows on KCXL, but at the time, his full-time job was being an engineer at Intercom Radio. Intercom, but, but was, do, was doing a show on, on 1140, though. Yeah, 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 at the time, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I got bespeckled after that, and I was like, wow, I can't believe that I didn't do this. It was always kind of a latent dream of mine, and it's like, let's do it. So we, in, you know, cultivated a friendship, cultivated this radio show, and I really learned from him. There were so many things I watched him do, and there you go. The show started, and we did it once a week. That was our goal. And how many uh, – I know the number is off the chart, but how, how, many, how many jazz musicians and those in the, in the genre have you interviewed? At this point, I've interviewed probably 1,213. Wow. That's the whole game. It's musicians and, and, and who else, mate? Is it people that are people that are writing, people that are in 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 the the in some way involved in, in the jazz scene. Yeah, yep, yeah, somehow involved. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And I gotta say, when I started the show I told John Christopher, 
I am not going to sit around and just read books of what people interpret jazz as being or pluck out of encyclopedias. I'm going to speak to the musicians. That's been a whole goal, and that's why I do the show the way I do it. Yeah. Well, it, it, it clearly works, and you guys, I, 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 I've always been, you know, I can, you know as well as I do, that I don't know, you may have people that, that have, have heard all 671 shows, I know you have, and listened to them probably over and over, but the, the shows I do get to listen to, I, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how, how well you two uh, uh, play off each other, and that, 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 whether you're talking about TV anchors or whether you're talking about uh, uh, people that are, that are doing political shows on cable or you're talking about afternoon drive time uh, rate talk radio where two, ang- two, two folks are, are on, you have to have a certain uh, symmetry and a certain understanding of what the knowledge base is with, with each host and, and, and what you've got, what your strengths are. And, and you and John, th- that must have happened early on, huh? Yeah. In fact, it's funny because John had a, a really rich hat background in radio. He came from Nebraska, had shows in Lincoln, had shows here. And he told me when we started doing this pretty quick after he said, uh, there's, he said, I've worked with a lot of people. I've reached out and there's a lot of people I know on radio and I, you would be the only person that I would do anything with. Like mm-hmm. seriously, like have a tandem with. So, you know, I kind of push this Facebook show that you see, which we call Neon Talk. Like it's kind of after we do our shows, we'll right. sit down and just talk. And that's what we call it. And it's kind of that back and forth. But yeah, we knew early on it was, it was chemistry. And especially when those mics got hot. I mean, that, that's an outgrowth of what we just do anyways. But when the mics come on, it's like we both have that background. So we just turn that whole broadcast thing on. And you will see, you, uh, you mentioned this earlier, you moved to Lee Summit in January of this year, right? Yes. Yeah. And you're doing the shows before COVID, you, or you still are. You were doing the shows from your house, from your new house. Yes. Yes. In, in Lee Summit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In Lee Summit. And you guys did those obviously together up until what? Up until early March, I'm assuming. And before yeah. 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 It was probably about a week before it hit, so probably like okay. early March. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and obviously the shows are still continuing through you, just not with with John as involved as he used to be. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, he's usually we we'd have banter going back and forth, and that hasn't happened. His um, his schedule just hasn't afforded it. And even doing something virtual, it's, it's hard to get that queued up. But our plan right. here very soon is to pick that back up. He came by about a week, week and a half ago, and he was just like me, just like, man, we got to get this going again. So that's going to kick right. back up. <laughs> well, it's, it's, that's an incredible number. I mean, I don't know that you, in 2011, that you could have, have predicted a, a, a time when you would have done over, I mean, when you would have done 100 shows or 200 shows or yeah. 482 shows or 671 shows, correct? I mean, that, that, I, I did, as this has picked up steam, I mean, we're going on almost 10 years of this show now. It's, it's wild. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. about that the other day. I was just looking at how time goes by, and I was like, wow, it's going to be 10 years. And just you think about those milestones, too. You know, I mean, 500 was a big episode, and then, you know, 600 just came up, and and then I'm coming up on 700. It's like, wow, it's just, it's amazing. And, you know, I still on Saturday morning, I take my son to a, a, a place in Weston. It's a, uh, it's called the farmer's house and it's the special needs kids run it. And I listen to my show on the way up and I don't mm-hmm. get a chance to do that that much. And sometimes I'm like, man, it's going way back to like 2012 or 2015. Right. And I'm like, it's wild. Just how many, also have been on there and I'm always so happy that these people get some kind of exposure because jazz is really hard to milk in any market. And you guys have built something up where you are probably up where maybe in the early days you had to, to, to really to, to really bust your ass if you don't mind the expression to, to to get some of these interviews where where you're being contacted probably nonstop now by by folks that want to be on the show, correct? Oh, yeah, they're, and they're grateful, and they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm on here. Or they get off the interview, and they're like, you know, I'll talk like, well, you know, this is where you can reach my show, or you can hear this. Oh, no, I've listened to your interviews. I listen to them all the time. Musicians <laughs> run into me, and they're like, 
they're like, I, I listen to all your interviews. I love it. Just totally. I, it's like, I operate in a vacuum. So when I hear that there's fans of something like what I'm doing, I'm like, oh, uh, okay. <laughs> like I, yeah. I just go with it. But, uh, but yeah, it's like at this point now, I get a lot of requests. And uh, it used to be something where I'd have to send out requests all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're, you're, you, are, you are most certainly the only uh, jazz show that's, or uh, the, jazz, the podcast that, that's recorded like this, and we sum it, I'm sure of that, correct? Oh, yeah, I would, I would imagine so. Yeah. 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 And, and I would even venture to say in Kansas City, the only yeah. other shows that are along this line on a regular rolling basis would be David Bassey has his show, and it's syndicated. David mm -hmm. Bassey's wonderful, and uh, K KKFI they have their shows in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, there's there's very few shows that are happening jazz oriented on a regular basis in this market. Yeah, yeah, and of course we you know we we uh, you're you guys are here now. I know you've had a good experience with with the schools and with Miles and things, and 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 that's that's a connection. That's a jazz connection, obviously that 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 people. Uh, probably make pretty quickly once they know how much you are uh, connected to the jazz scene, obviously, who your son is named after, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and it's interesting, too. Uh, my stepdaughter, Jilly, is really thriving in the, in the Lee Summit School District. She's a dancer, and she loves it here. And both of them had the opportunity over this pandemic when we had downtime to hear me do these interviews. So that was kind of a cool thing. And a lot of these jazz people were very optimistic. So it was very rare because I just kind of do these during the day when I have time. And I had more time, so I would put it on speaker. And they really got to listen and be a part of some of these interviews, which was cool. That's, that's really cool. And do and you mind if I mention that Miles goes to Miller Park? Oh, no, please do. Yeah. And then and you can Jilly, – Jilly goes to uh, Lee Summit, uh, just the regular Lee Summit High School. Lee Summit High. Yeah, and you said they both have had an opportunity to, to during a pandemic to listen to some of those interviews. Yeah, they've been in the car, and I'll put it on speaker, and they listen, and they hear. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, there's been times where, um, yeah, if they're listening to people that are in Paris or London or um, in Denmark or Holland, um, Sweden, you know, either of the coasts, and they got very unique perspectives from this pandemic from all over the world. It yeah, was, it was pretty cool. It was an intentional, unintentional. You know what I'm saying? It's like I didn't know how these were going to manifest, but it was just really kind of a way for them because you know no one was doing anything for a while there. It was a really good way for them to break up the monotony of not having anything to do and right. to really hear how the world globally was dealing with it. I mean, they got the perspective that it wasn't just a localized thing. The whole world was going through this and these jazz musicians yeah. were overwhelmingly optimistic so it was kind of a good way of keeping the spirits up so to speak and so how how long does this how long does this go you, you you know obviously you don't put a you never put a we put a start date on so many things that we do whether it's a new job or a relationship or having a child or anything but you know you, you don't really think about you know how long we're going to do something but in your perfect world this this show goes on for a long time, doesn't it? It's like, it's like anything you do in life. It's like, you know, going for a walk or um, exercising or, you know, writing. You know, you're, you're a writer. You're always going to write. Like, there's a part of what you do that becomes a part of what makes you a healthy human on this planet. And to me, this jazz diet that fits in with everything that I do is totally a part of me putting my shoes on in the morning and going out and starting a car and very basic functions of being alive. I mean, it's obviously on a higher level, but I love it. And I love these musicians. It's like, it's, dude, it's a community that I had no idea about. And now that I've been in there, I am, I am just so happy. And that's the one thing, too, about a lot of these musicians. A lot of these musicians come back and contact me. For instance, I'll give you an example. And I meant to tell you this, because this is something that's been just blown my mind, and this was during the pandemic. There was a young man named David Billingsley, and I was, during the pandemic, really reaching out more, just because there was a lot of people that were shell-shocked and weren't reaching out. A lot of PR agents weren't reaching out. And I just started finding, I'd get on iTunes and look up the people that were coming out with albums. There was a young man out of Minneapolis named David Billingsley, 
sent a request, and he didn't even get back with me yet and put on Facebook and tagged me and said, I sent out 300 or 400 requests to radio stations last week for my brand new album, and no one replied, and this guy from Kansas City out of the blue got in touch with me. And he said, God, God is great, and he works in, in magical ways. And I was just blown away. I was just sitting there. I was like, wow, the fact that I ran into this cat. And his music's wonderful. He's really high up on the iTunes charts. So anyway, this happens, and it was a week before George Floyd happened, and he lives right up there, okay? So I get the interview done. I work on it real quick and get it to him, send it to him, because he was ecstatic to do the interview. I don't hear anything for like five days. Now, but Dan, this is a guy that runs a school up there for young inner city kids that don't have opportunities to be in music. He is a very intelligent, very well put together young African American man. And he didn't get back, and I could tell by his post, he knew that there was looters that weren't from Minneapolis. All the neighborhoods were on fire, and he was breaking. And I called him, and I was almost in tears, and I said, David, I need you to listen to me right now. I'm just the guy in Kansas City to interview you. And I said, you need to stay in this. You are the one that's going to lead this community, and I want you to to listen to me for what I'm worth and what we've had up to this point. I want you to keep doing it. You are the one that's going to be the light that's going to break through this darkness right now. And you've got to figure, he's in Minneapolis. George Floyd just died. He, the last thing he probably wanted to hear with some white radio host in in Kansas City telling him something like this. But I felt it deep down in me. You have to do this. This guy sent me an autographed copy of his album a week and a half later, thanked me for the interview because he finally got his clouds up and got his head above the clouds and said, thank you for doing that. You pulled me out. And I just on my birthday got another volume of his music signed on my birthday without him even knowing it, and it blew my mind. Those are the kinds of things that are happening with this show, that just every single day I see these things happen, and there's a connection that's so real and so good, and it's so beneficial for, for all of us involved. I love that. And t- tell me his name again. His name is David Billingsley. He's amazing, man. He's, he's a really good cat, released material late in life, but he has a school he has there for the kids. I mean, he is a beacon in the world of, like, of, in the black community, you know, and yeah. I just saw him breaking, man. Every time I see a post, he was like, I, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And it broke my heart, man. Like I, I've seen a lot of things and we were already going through a pandemic and there was already that heartbreak. But when I saw this guy for what he was doing and for him to say, I'm going to quit because some officers decided to do what they did. I was like, there ain't no way if I have any power in this, I'm going to, I'm going to try to pull this guy away from it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, that's the power of, of, your voice and the power of the podcast too, man. That's that's amazing. It was that's good. Amazing. It was it, it was it was an unexpected surprise. But yeah, I think we both really. I think in the end, we both did each other a, a really good turn. You know, we were supposed to run into each other. I can say that. <laughs> sure. That's awesome, man. Well, you, I I I think this will be. Uh, this is something that that I want to make sure to put all the contacts in here. Obviously. Uh, I'm going to put the website where people can, can find you guys and find all the old shows, uh, which is the blog spot, right? Neonjazz.blogspot, is that right? Yeah, yeah and it mutates out into, um, I have, you know, it's all, all the shows are on Mixcloud, and then I put them on, my interviews on YouTube. I kind of, I try to put them in the easier locations, and I can send you over the specific links, so if you want to reference those. But yeah, Blogspot's pretty much it, because I put all my links up on there. Maybe that's the easiest, because that's like one spot. You don't want to confuse everybody. Well, and, 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 you, and you're still updating the, the, the Facebook stuff, too. So. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All of that gets mutated, and then that copies out to Twitter, so all of that kind of gets thrown into one big honeypot, for sure. Good, good, good. You know, I, I, uh, I, of course, I, you know, was, was along with everyone else on Facebook reminiscing about, uh, Eddie Van Halen, but in the last couple of weeks, I, I, you know, I saw them in, uh, in 2012 at the uh, Sprint Center with Brian. And, yeah. and my, my takeaway, obviously, you know, seeing Wolfgang and seeing Eddie Van Halen, but that was the tour that David Lee Roth came back for. If you remember, he yep. joined the band back for that tour. Um, but uh, uh, 
they were off their game that night. In fact, they were they were they were uh, the 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 Kansas State Star Review and some other people on the radio said, you know, obviously the you know the individual members of the band still had it, but David Lee Roth was was missing lyrics, and he was you know he's he's getting lyrics wrong, or he's just skipping entire lines of lyrics, and and you could and then he's and the, the whole time he's he's flirting with this you know this girl in the front first or second row and it became increasingly uncomfortable but then but then you, the opener that night was uh oh gosh who's the uh uh, uh who's the uh uh big the huge uh uh band from the 70s there's 20 members of the band and they're, they're the big band type stuff. Um, uh, I saw out. that. Sh- I saw one of yeah. those shows. I think they had multiple. And I remember David Lee Roth was up. I can't remember who the opener was. I can't no, even I'm, remember. I yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna remember. Oh, cool in the gang. It was cool in the gang. Oh yeah yeah yeah. And, you got it. yeah. And, that's and, right. And we and then and cool in the gang opens and you go man because there are so many of the original members that are still with that band. But yeah. Cool and the Gang prides itself on putting just putting on a they just put on it. Man, they're just up there having fun. And they're 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 playing the horns and the trumpets and they're dancing and they're singing and, and, and man they put on a show and you think, This is gonna be a great show. Well then Van Halen comes on and kinda you kinda go, Oh man, okay, they're a little past their prime. But then you get to the end of the night and you think, Man, the Cool and the Gang really stole the show. I'm glad and yeah. it was the only time in my life I've ever gotten to see Cool and the Gang uh live, honestly. So yeah. Uh, it was just, it was interesting. I, I don't know why it made me think of that. We were talking about Eddie Van Halen, but uh, and that's the one thing, man. I, I tell you, I miss live music right now more than anything. Even just the, oh, the man. small little concerts we'd have here in the park in Lee Summit, usually on Friday nights here that we that we don't have, and 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 it's it's just uh, you you long to to get back to that thing, and you kind of wonder what what live music and live shows are gonna are going to look like in the future, right? You know, that's the thing that's interesting about it. I, was at, I, I, don't, I thought they had multiple shows, but my nephew at the time was really wanting to see Eddie Van Halen, and I took him down there, and I remember it was weird. Like, I was just like, something's wrong here. I mean, the guys sounded good, but yeah, Lee, David Lee Roth was doing weird jumps. Oh, yeah. Things. yeah. He, you know, he was just, but you know, you're right. With live music, that's the weird thing. Like, that's the thing that's bittersweet about moving to Lee Summit when I did. I remember when I moved here for that first couple months and even before, we went to the art festival last year. I was just like, I can't believe because we were so excited. We went to uh, Conrad's the night before, a couple nights before yep. the Super Bowl, and it was packed. We were like, this place is hopping. When it gets warm and it was just getting to be March, we were so excited. We knew it was potential. And that was the thing. It's like this whole area, like downtown Lee Summit to us, was always like another downtown Kansas City. Like we weren't gonna have to drive all the way downtown. We could go to downtown Lee Summit, and we still do. But it's like music's gonna be weird because I went to some shows this summer that were drive up, and it's like you drive up in your car, everybody's masked. Right. I mean, the people that are are playing. Like we went to one show, and it was uh, um, it was under. It, they thought it was gonna rain, so it was underneath the parking garage, and. The, the guitarist was joking around that it was like a, a weird Mad Max movie. Like, it's a pandemic, <laughs> it's the future, <laughs> and all of the instruments were ricocheting off. There was this guy, Rich Wheeler, that came up and played the sax, and it just blew through there like a mini Red Rock. And it was oh, amazing. Wow. But it was just, but all of those things, I think that's the thing, but Dorn, what we're going to have to understand about music and the world is we are going to limp, what, depending on how you look at this, but we're going to get back. And there's yeah. no other choice right now. Yeah. And if we can get a little bit of music, like I saw a guy on 39th Street a while back that was doing some music, and I was so happy. Anytime I see people out doing music, it's like, that, that's it, man. Let's do it. Let's go. You know? Um, so it's, it's going to come back, and it's going to be okay. And hopefully we're all going to look back on this. Not that we're ever going to really – Look at highlights of cutout heads in baseball stadiums and say, "Wow, I want to look at that over and over again." <laughs> well, how? But and to wrap it's that, so up, bizarre. How's your? How is your? Since you moved here, how's your least time experience been? I want to include a little bit of that in the column too. I it, I, I love it, man. I I really do. I really feel like the community is open. It's welcoming. It's a mini metropolis. It's a mini Kansas City. 
We love going downtown. We love the places downtown. It has a very nice feel to it. Uh, we love the fountains. Um, you know, Miles and I go to the fountains. There's a lot of areas to drive around, and, and I mean, we're still running into new things. It's just a, it's a really, really nice community, and there's a lot going on. And when this pandemic lets up a little bit, there's going to be much more going on. So it's it's cool, man. It's really good to be here. We we've we've as you know, we're well publicized. You know, we've had you know some some hiccups in the schools and and with the city and things like that. But but you kind of when you take when you take, I think when you take the overall picture of Lee Summit, you you, you do get a sense that uh, uh, artistically and from a downtown standpoint, from a business standpoint, we are in a very good position in this city. Yeah, and from what I've dealt with so far, you know, I have two kids that are in school. They're yeah. both having having a, a good experience in school. I mean, we knew that immediately coming in. And I got a pool put in. Didn't think I was, but I had to get a building permit and go through all that. That was easy. They made it painless. I dealt with the city. It was good. Um, you know, I even told you with that dog situation this summer, we didn't know what was going on. That ended up being no big deal. So there was a lot of yeah. things so far that have been just fine, you know, and we experienced it firsthand. Well, and you're, you're bringing a little bit of, 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 of jazz to this town. And, this, and, this, and as, much as, we, as much as those of us in the know revere Pat Matheny, there's so many people in the town that just don't know who he is, and that that's it, it's one of those things you go, man, do you not realize what this guy's done worldwide? But he, but 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 uh, most people know that he grew up here. Maybe they just don't have the sense of of what his contributions have been uh, to, to to the music industry, they, and and most people won't get that because uh, because there are not a lot of connections between you know the, the Matheny family and you know, has been has been long gone and. You know, there just aren't, there aren't those connections here anymore. But, but you you you'd like to be able to probably celebrate, you know, not only what he's done, but also what jazz brings to communities, and 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 uh, probably you know do a little bit of education on that. With with you know, if you could pick up some at least some of the listeners, that'd probably be a good thing, right? Yeah, and and that's the thing. You know, if it was a quarterback for the Denver Broncos, it'd be a different story. But it's a jazz musician um, <laughs> from a legacy that, that, that's a long time ago. But you know, I I did a lot of interviews by that fountain downtown this summer, which is uh, a great. And I was I the sign, and I'd have people from like Buenos Aires that were like, "Oh yeah, we know Pat Metheny," and I'm just sitting there like, "Wow, I'm standing by the sign at Lee Summit where this guy's from, and this guy's in Buenos Aires telling me." How when he was a kid, that was his influence. That's who he loved, and mm -hmm. and it was. I mean, everybody that plays guitar or even anybody else, they're like, wait, Lee Summit. Is that what Pat Metheny's from? Like, I mean, everybody in the jazz world knows that. So yeah. whether or not people in Lee Summit realize it or not, that is a huge calling card. Now, a quarterback for the Broncos or some other people that are coming out sure. of the Summit, it's yeah. a big deal, absolutely. But I think that one of the original calling cards. In a music sense, is Ben Papatini. Yeah. So it's interesting how that all pans out for sure. All right, my friend. You got it, man. Mad love. Cheers. All right. Thanks, brother. Ciao. Thanks for listening and tuning into another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and radio makers in jazz all over the world. And thanks to Mr. John Bedoin for being a huge, integral reason that you even hear Neon Jazz and all the fine work he has done and will do in the future for both the world of journalism and the media at large. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com for everything Neon Jazz all the time. Go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.